welcome to the Peas Please Veg Summit, which we're delighted to be hosting here in the River Cottage kitchen garden. And as you can see, the veg is positively bursting out all around me. But what we're going to be talking about today is what we can do to get the consumption of vegetables in the UK rising up throughout the whole nation. Because if we succeed in that, that could be transformative for the nation's health. So to discuss this urgent and knotty question, we've convened a panel of policymakers, politicians and business leaders. But we also want to hear from you. What do you think we should be doing to make this happen? We have made encouraging progress in some areas, but it's slow. And unfortunately, in other areas, it looks like things are getting worse. Nearly one third of five to 10 year olds eat less than one portion of veg a day. One fifth of kids and teens veg intake is actually from ultra processed food, mainly pizzas and baked beans. And the richest 20% of Britons eat one more portion of veg a day compared to the poorest 20%. So what's stopping the vegetable business speeding up so we can truly become a veg eating nation? Less than 2% of food and soft drink advertising spend goes towards promoting veg. And calorie for calorie, foods high in sugar or fat are a third of the cost of vegetables. If we did get our five a day, we could add eight months to our life expectancy and cut our greenhouse gas emissions. We'd also increase the value of UK veg production. And if we ate seven a day, we could add another one billion pounds to the economy. And to kick things off, let's hear from Neil Parrish, our local MP here in East Devon. He also happens to be chair of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee. It is wonderful today to be here at River Cottage and thank you to Hugh for hosting this veg conference. Here we are nestling in the Blackdown Hills in one of the most beautiful parts of Devon and one of the most beautiful parts of the country. We have an opportunity now to get more vegetables eaten by our poorest in society, by our children, and make sure that veg is promoted across all that we eat. As we move away from the common agricultural policy, we have a great opportunity now to link what we are producing on the land to what we are eating, and that is absolutely essential. So I'm looking forward Forward to the conclusions of this conference so that we can build up government policy to actually deliver this and make sure more vegetables are eaten and we eat them more regularly. Welcome to the panel session. 2021 is undoubtedly a year of opportunity with COP26 coming up later in the year. We have a United Nations push on fruit and vegetables and we couldn't have a better team than this panel to talk about making the most of this opportunity. I'm delighted to be joined by the DEFRA Minister, Victoria Prentice. Uh, her responsibilities include the national food strategy, uh, farming generally, including the much discussed agriculture bill and COVID-19 issues related to food for the vulnerable. And I'm thrilled that we have Baroness Rosie Boycott, a crossbench peer who was leading on food strategy in London with Boris Johnson a few years back. Uh, she's also a trustee of the Food Foundation and Veg Power, and she's the chair of Feeding Britain. Alan Dangor is a professor of food and nutrition for global health, and he's also director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine's Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health. Sarah Bradbury is Group Quality Director for Tesco, driving their affordable, sustainable and healthy food for all commitments. And from the Compass Group, we're joined by Charlotte Cool, Director of Communications and Corporate Affairs at Compass. Compass serve up more than one million meals a day to, among other places, schools, hospitals, offices and factories. So this is a panel that really know how important vegetables are to the health of the nation. But we also know that they need to be doing so much more, they need to be working much harder for us. And so we're going to talk about what we can all do to make a difference. I want to start with Victoria Prentice. Um, your government has an obesity strategy, it's got a food strategy, uh, it's been talking about five a day for a very long time, and yet I, I think we, we sense, well, and we have the, the statistics to, to be pretty sure, that after all this time, we are stuck on the business 
of getting more people, especially young people, to eat more vegetables. Why are we stuck and how are we going to get unstuck? It's right that we are stuck. We have made some tiny pieces of progress with the five a day strategy and it's quite well known in the national consciousness. However, with children and with poorer demographics, we really are not making the breakthroughs we need to make. So we definitely we need to recognise that and we need to work on it. We've got a big food summer ahead of us um, going into the winter. Henry Dimbleby is going to publish his report, which I think will be very challenging for government and very groundbreaking in about a month's time in July. We then have six months as government to respond to that. We've got processy things to do, which are important, but fundamentally, I think we need to get excited as government about growing and eating more local, sustainable British produce, putting the right money into promoting horticulture, and then some really exciting work with schools and advertising to make sure that that feeds through to the population. Well, you mentioned advertising, but of course, at the moment, less than 2% of the advertising spend on food and drink is spent on vegetables. Considerably I mean, less. <laughs> well, it's about 1.9, but yeah. it, it, I mean, it's a pitiable amount. Yeah. And, and so what's coming in the, in the other direction is a barrage of, of junk food advertising. Uh, we have heard some noises from government uh, that there is going to be action, particularly on junk food advertising and the watershed. Um, we've heard rumblings for a long time now. Is this the year where we're going to see decisive act, uh, action from government to achieve the target of halving child obesity by 2030? I hope so. I personally think a lot of positive messaging is part of the solution. If you eat one more portion of fruit or veg a day, you are not eating by its very nature something that wouldn't be as good for you. So I think promotion is probably going to be the key to this. Yes, of course, as government, we have to work on things that we don't like, things we want to regulate, things we want to ban. But I suspect the way we're going is lots of positive promotion. Advertising doesn't have to be paid for by government. It can and is being paid for by um, supermarkets, for example. At the moment, there are some really exciting advertising campaigns and there's also one um, by the, the Food Foundation. They're doing great work in this space too. So I think we should recognise that. But I think working with children at the very beginning, we know that those early years are really critical to the way people feel about food, touching food, playing with food, putting it in their mouths and then ultimately eating it is really important. I used to teach cooking to a after school class of reception age and they just wanted to play with food like like a toy and there's nothing wrong with that and we know that these early stages really make a difference to what they will want to eat when they grow up. I heartily agree with that and I, I think most of us on this panel know that you've touched on many of the right things there um, but talking about them isn't the same as delivering them and so what assurance do we have that the government is really going to step up and, and have policy and, and, and also restrictions, for example, on junk food advertising that will help to deliver these, these ideals that we can Completely talk about. Completely fair. I don't want to hog the conversation and there is an awful lot that we need to talk about. Um, that we will do the regulatory things we have to do. We also need, though, um, to work with retailers in the way that we've also learned about during the okay, last well, year. Maybe this is yeah, a good so moment. Br to, bring to, in Sarah. To, well, Sarah, you're, you're here on, on, on behalf of Tesco, but maybe you're also here on behalf of the retail sector. Um, but Tesco probably sell or aim to sell more vegetables than any other single business in the country. So if you can't succeed in selling more vegetables to us, this isn't going to happen. So what's changing for Tesco that's going to make a difference? So we've been on our reformulation journey for a while now, uh, for the last 10 years, where we've looked at reducing salt and sugar. Um, recently, we've actually moved to reformulating around adding veg in, and that's been a real positive move. So we've moved within our ready meals from 26 to 55% portions of veg, 
um, and we're really starting to look at how we can promote more as well. So in our large stores, we have a fresh five. So every week we do different promotions. We've just launched in 400 of our smaller stores. Uh, we're calling it fresh three, but actually how do you sell more at a better price? Because we do know that one of the big barriers is around price um, and actually visibility. So making sure that we've got more promotions on healthier products, especially in the smaller stores, um, it is really important. And then regulatory wise, you know, we really welcome the changes that are coming next year from the obesity strategy. It gives us a really good opportunity to relook at the way we offer everything to customers. I mean, I, I can see that this um, veg by stealth, that yep. you're adding veg in the same way that you were taking out salt and, and sugar from, from some of your formulated dishes. That's not the same as getting people walking out the door with a trolley full of fresh veg which for their families to enjoy during the week. That's surely where we have to get to. Now, Rosie, you've been uh, in this space for a long time, uh, watching and, and consulting and, and goading people like Victoria and Sarah to do better and achieve more. What do you think, uh, dare, I, dare I say, what do you think these guys are missing? What is, are there creative things or new approaches uh, that, that go beyond what's been tried before that we're gonna have to get to to unlock this problem and, and get the nation eating more veg? Oh, I think there's quite a few and, and they have been touched on. We've definitely got to promote veg in a very serious and big way. And I think you'd only have to look at the 98% of advertising that is spent on fast food, the types of cartoon characters, the inducements. And if you go online, well, it's quite frankly, it's everywhere. And it's very seductive. The food companies, and Tesco is included in this, are incredibly clever. And they understand our taste buds and they understand that insane desire for the, the combo of sugar, fats and salts that are really truly addictive things to people. I mean, it's not a myth this, it's, it's you have it and you want more. They also have zero nutritional value, so they have no good at filling you up. So we have to attack that problem head on and say, if we want this to happen, it's not just going to be because uh, Veg Power, which Hugh and I are involved in, you know, manages to raise a bit of charity money and produce some adverts on ITV in the mornings on Saturdays. They've really got to thump it home and say, this is fabulous. But you've got to do a lot more than that. Henry Dimbleby's food strategy is going to try to look at the system. Mm. I'm concerned that uh, the system is complicated, mm. incredibly complicated, involves the environment, involves all manner of things, and needs such a big rethink and whether, whether the government will have the bulls in a way at the end of the day to, to walk up to that and to start to turn that around. Because we are facing such a huge health crisis now with our kids and I don't know how many people saw, you know, Chris Van Tulliken living on junk food. It starts to affect your brain patterns. I mean, we are, and it's time we accepted it, we are the most sophisticated machine on the planet. We don't even understand how our body works yet, but we do know that just like a Maserati, if you stick Coca-Cola into it, it's going to collapse by the end of the road. And we are not our best, and these are issues of of um, human rights and poverty and equality. So it's a very, very complex picture. And I've been an advisor on Henry's strategy, so I know the scope that he's trying to achieve. And I guess I, I worry whether any government's going to be ballsy enough to completely do you, up do you think there's a danger that the food strategy is almost too big picture and we need to get very specific, which is what we're talking about today, yeah. about getting more people, especially well, kids, to eat veg I think that a, that, as a sort of priority that yes. could maybe leapfrog the other issues? I think um, that that's absolutely true and that if we can start the process of kids eating veg, and I'm very keen on what Victoria says and I'd really like to see it backed up by government action, get localisation, get I mean, nobody will be able to grow quite like you do, Hugh, but get local growing because also that works into our climate goal, that works into our biodiversity goals. These are win-win-win situations right the way down, down the train. And we, we absolutely have to start doing that. And I think that we, you know, we, we do run a real risk right now that the power of the multinationals, who I think are fighting a bit of a rear guard battle, we have to, for instance, as the Food Foundation has said in their reports, if you want to buy um, 
healthy food is going to cost you about five times more to buy the calorific value in vegetables mm. than it's going to cost you to mm. buy it in fast chicken, in fast food and fried yeah. chicken. That's a mighty problem that yeah. you cannot pr expect pr yeah. your average consumer on their own to solve. It doesn't matter how much education you give them in schools, how many kind of bananas or whatever you wave at them, it's got to change. And if you look at also what early years are doing, I find that the lack of strict regulation around um, introducing of solids to babies, some of these pouches which are sold looking like green with nice lettuce leaves and cabbages on them. Reality is they're 80% pear and banana. And yeah. I've tried these things and they're like eating boiled sweets. Yeah. So yeah. we're educating so, so, people so, at four months old yeah. to have this yeah. high sugar yeah. demand. Yeah. They're yes. never going to like a cabbage. So right the way through, we yeah. need a much, much tougher approach. And I, I do think that... It, can, I, can, I do, can I just... Yeah. B b b I want to bring in every, everyone else as well. Um, we, we are, and I mean, this is a government that until, well, until about a year ago, uh, a bit more than a year ago, wasn't really noted for its health intervention policies, uh, or indeed c clipping the wings of big business or curbing the actions uh, of business in, in any kind of meaningful way. That has changed now. We've just been experiencing and are still experiencing the biggest health intervention, uh, not just in this country, but globally. Um, does everybody think that may have changed the agenda a bit? And, and yeah. Alan, I want to bring you in here. Um, and we're talking about, a, it seemed to be quite a systemic problem. We've got, we've got a broken food system that, that is pretty much mainlining junk food uh, of high calorific value to the poorest people in the country. It's a huge problem. How, how do we change the system, Alan? Well, I think this begins with a... Uh, first of all, a recognition that the food system does an extraordinary job in delivering food for the people in the UK and globally. So there are some important things to recognise. Farmers work incredibly hard, the food system works incredibly hard to deliver food. Of course, you raise the point, what food is it delivering and how much regulation is needed and how much promotion should be allowed and what should be promoted. And what we, where we are now is a food system that, that is doing multiple things wrong. As well as delivering healthy food, it is delivering some healthy food. It's delivering very unhealthy food to large parts of the world. It is, it is really having an extraordinary impact on the environment. Uh, and, and, it, and it isn't recognising its role in, 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 in looking after the future of our health and the health of the planet. What, what, what are the levers that can be pulled? What are the fixes that can change the incentives for, for agriculture and food production? That, that, I mean, is it going to take government intervention? Is, is... The first thing that needs to happen is the government, the, the, for the food strategy is a very interesting case in point. It is for the first time recognising that these things are joined up. They're not just little silos. I produce food, you do health, you do education, whatever. But these things are joined up. And without that bigger picture, grown-up discussion about the, the, the interconnected nature of these things, we can't move forward. And that's, well, that's what we've done so far. We've kept everything separate, and that has led to this dis disjointed and disconnected policies. The food strategy will enable those things to come together. The question then is, how do we respond to these really massive systemic questions? And again, it's a question of, to my mind, number one, we're all of us growing up quite a lot. We're in the midst of a climate emergency. We're not taking it anywhere seriously enough. We're in the midst of a health emergency. The government has failed to deliver an obesity strategy that works or protect young children from a horrific obes obesogenic environments. And we need to be much clearer about that whilst you know, so we need to, the government needs to be much clearer. And we also need to recognize our responsibilities. And, 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 and enable people to make the right choices and support them uh, to eat healthily in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. But is, is it naive to suggest that significantly increasing the amount of veg we eat would make a really big impact on health outcomes and even on the burden on the NHS in five, 10, 15 years from now and on, on the climate issue? All right. I mean, it, 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 because I've been, <laughs> among those who 
thumping loudly saying, yes, it, re it really is that simple. Eat more veg, these things will happen. So there's, it's, there's clear epidemiological evidence that eating a diet which has more fruit and vegetables in it is better for your health. And that's very clear, very consistent, shown. Uh, that's why the, the UK, the Public Health England Eat Well Guide, uh, has a large proportion of fruit and vegetables and complex carbohydrates from grains and, and, and brown, brown flour and those sorts of things. And yeah. could, can I ask you also to be the one to say it's also true that moving to a plant-based diet will help the environment and, and combat climate change? There is no question that, uh, that, 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 that the, the, the elephant in the room, unfortunately, is the elephant, which is a, you know, so, there's no question that we need to, we need to move to a plant-based diet. And the exciting thing there is that this move is already happening. So we can see the amount of meat being eaten in the UK is declining. That's, that's, a ve that's very clear statistics. We can also see from analysis we're just producing uh, shortly to be published is that there is an increase in the amount of plant-based foods being consumed, plant-based alternatives being consumed, especially by the younger generation but also by older generations. So there is a switch. Why is that switch? It's because these alternatives have become more the norm. They're being supported. There's, there's, you know, the industry is taking, taking a major role in, in making them more available, reducing their price. And I'm pretty confident that there'll be a transformational change in the availability of alternatives, in these alternatives to meats in the future. There is no question that a plant-based diet, a, 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 a majority plant-based diet, I'm not saying vegan, you know, I'm saying a majority plant-based diet, it's better for human health and clearly it's better for the environment. And, and you yeah. know, it's shift, making that shift at a global scale, at a national and a global scale, is absolutely essential if we're to tackle the combined health and climate emergencies. But, but no reason at all why, why we shouldn't lead the way. I, I want to bring Charlotte in here. Charlotte, um, if, if Sarah and Tesco are responsible or trying to sell more vegetables to the nation than anyone else, I'm, I think I'm right in saying you're probably putting more uh, food on plates for, for the nation than, than pretty much any other business. And it is incredibly important what those plates look like. I mean, we, Alan's just referred to, to the Eat Well diet. And, um, and, and you know, plates of food from here on need to have a lot more vegetables on them. How seriously do you take that responsibility in your sector? Well, we at Compass very seriously. And I think this interlink between planet and the food system sort of finally rising up in terms of consciousness because climate change we're there but that pressure on big businesses like ours global businesses which is sort of climate first but obviously as a food business that that's incredibly helpful for us because it's driven our ambition we've set a net zero carbon target in the UK for our business for 2030 which is a going to involve a huge transformation and will mean a majority plant-based diet right across all the different sectors in which we operate um, but do you have a company-wide policy on the amount of veg that needs to be on your plates of food, whether you're serving it to uh, schools or hospitals or, or office or work canteens, or indeed in the, in, in the influence you have in, in the restaurant sector? We do, and the year-on-year -year pledge we've made is 20% increase in, in vegetables um, for, for the year ahead, and then that sort of longer-term, decade-long ambition around the sort of net zero um, carbon. And, and so how does that come to pass? Is that in the way that you're educating your chefs? Uh, it, it, in yeah. How they're designing dishes on the plate? Multifaceted, but you know, we're a business where cooking is our core competency. We've got you know, half a million predominantly chefs that work around the world. So training, training in sustainability, training in menu engineering. I mean, there is some of hiding vegetables. I mean, I, I hear you about that's not the only way. We need to embrace and teach through schools the love of vegetables and incorporate that too. But there is some, you know, more use of vegetables within um, sources and the like. So the big approach on, on skills, there's sort of nudge techniques around tech. So lots more of the people that we serve food to now order, you know, on a prepay or sort of app-based system. And, and that helps us to nudge them around nutrition because we can track what they're choosing and we can and those nudge techniques they do really help so take teenagers they're a really difficult um you know consumer group for us to to change primary is is much more controlled environment but teenagers you know the nudge techniques putting a heart signal um against healthier options putting it top of the menu sort of literally top of the menu that gets a 10 percent take up of healthier options so so there's lots but, we can uh, do are you dabbling with that or is that now policy through the business it's 
definitely policy through the business. But I think the, the biggest change that's driven by the climate ambition is the sort of procurement transformation, so right through our supply chain. So that will couple with training of chefs, that will couple with, couple with the tech that we can use to nudge um, customer choices. But procurement will be completely transformed. Compass was in the spotlight a bit over a, a year ago on the, in the, the rollout of um, support meals for, for, yeah. for, for poor families. Um, and in particular, that the, the, they didn't look like great value and they certainly didn't look um, very healthy. Mm. Um, did that make a difference to the way you thought about your, your responsibilities? It did. It put a, put a big focus on our school's business. I mean, fortunately, we mostly cook food in schools and serve cooked meals that are properly balanced that that you know was out of our sort of um, core service and, and it was harder to get the right types of food in the right quantities and quality at short notice so so we did have an issue there but um, you know what we love to do is cook in schools we do cooking lessons we've done a lot of work with pupils to understand which vegetables they like so rose it's not cabbage yet that's not in the top five um but probably not broccoli either it is broccoli oh, is it, it is okay. broccoli is and, and actually knowing what they like having a hero vegetable a week you know making mm -hmm. it fun and engaging those things really really help but but for government i think in primary schools it's a regulated environment it's so important to get those habits in and you can do it because you you can control what kids are eating you can get participation up it's not full participation in school meals uh, you know, free school meals could be provided more over holidays at breakfast time. So there's lots more that government could do around that environment and we want to work with them to do that better. And you mentioned the, the education of kids going along with the food. Mm. Uh, do you see yourselves as partners of the school you're in? And I mean, do you actually have dialogues with the, the heads and the teachers uh, uh, to make sure that the food that you're putting on the plate meshes with the, the way children are being educated about food? Yeah, we do. And it is a partnership because we have the nutrition expertise. So that's what we bring to the school in the discussions. Actually, the, the difficulties we had through the COVID period actually made head teachers get more involved and, and talk to us more, which was really valuable for both, part, you know, both parties. So we've got more engaged with schools over this period of time. So I think the, the change we can drive is much bigger. British horticulture could and should get a massive boost if we succeed in the sort of aims we're, we're, we're talking about in this discussion. Um, are there specific ways that we can support people who grow vegetables, uh, whether, whether we're buying them to uh, supermarkets or whether we're DEFRA looking to support our farmers? Yes, and we're looking at them very hard at the moment. I'm from a horticultural background. Um, we grew plums as I grew up. That's one of the reasons I'm called Victoria. <laughs> Won't surprise you to know. Fantastic. I'm um, so but, delighted to hear that. <laughs> but, um, I, and I'm certainly not the only, the only minister in DEFRA who is very sensitised to the importance of the horticulture system. Our Secretary of State comes from a strawberry farming background. Um, but despite that, it, the figures are enough on their own. We grow 53% um, of the fruit and veg we eat in the UK. We grow 16% of the fruit, which gives you some idea of the scale of the problem, but also the scale of the opportunity, frankly. We're going through an extraordinary time in British farming. We've left the common agricultural policy. We are now rewarding farmers in a completely different way. Many of these schemes have the environment and biodiversity rightly front and center we will slightly do, do, do however they have, do they have british horticulture yeah, that, front and we, center too? slightly separately we are going to have to reward people and incentivize people to go into horticulture the will is there the desire is there it doesn't take up much land it gives us lots of other land available for all of the other policies that we're very keen to carry on pursuing but intensive British horticulture is very much something that we want to promote in DEFRA. We've got pilots going on at the moment of our sustainable farming initiative. We have a horticulture one. I am not convinced we've got everything right yet. That's partly why we're piloting it. Um, we're working hard later this year to put out a sort of incentive scheme, help with automation, for example, which is really important in the picking space and, and sometimes in the planting space. But I think the way we reward horticulture in the future is going to be completely different. CAP didn't do that. It rewarded farmers for just owning land. 
broadly in horticulture, we, we don't have a lot of land. We do things intensively on a small area. We now have the opportunity to get that right and really change those figures. 16% fruit, that, that's not enough. Uh, we could be much more self-sufficient in, 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 in grey veg. Rosie. Um, I just, I mean, I'm very, very happy to hear that that's the government intention, but I mean, I fail yet to see the, so to speak, money where the mouth is, because if you just took the fact that most procurement of, say, apples, which go into schools, those apples are not British apples. They're coming from China. They're also super sweet and kind of quite weird because they have been modified. And I, as I say, I applaud your intention, but please tell me, are we going to uh, subsidise? Are we going to do something? I mean, at the yeah, minimum, I mean, I, all government I, procurement could say yeah. you're going to just massively I increase this figure. Pro procurement is the mouth where the money needs to go, isn't it? And it's Absolutely. Been, and it's something that has been levelled at government year after year after year and not much seems to change and British horticulturals, British horticulturalists, uh, veg growers, uh, in my experience, feel like uh, the poor relation mm. of the poor relation that is farming. Well, we, and, and We've never been rewarded in, in the old cap system. And now this is our opportunity to put that right. We're but doing it's a not review. in the elms, Victoria. I mean, well, we are. It is part of the sustainable farming incentive. It's not. I don't think we've got it right yet, but we are actively piloting at the moment. Okay. Our, on procurement, we are reviewing... Um, the government procurement rules this summer. So this is the um, moment to have your say. As, as, as someone who's spent a fair amount of time in my uh, TV work um, levelling uh, these issues at both government and business, um, I hear a lot about pilots and I hear a lot uh, about trials. Um, and often this feels like window dressing, that this is essentially, no, I'm, I'm this essentially allows, us, allows you to say, and sometimes allows the supermarkets to say, yes, we, we hear you, we're on the case. Right, so I'm we've got, come back we've got on two that stores then, that, are, may, that are doing refill or one store no. that's promoting. So what's going to change in, tell us something about, make, tell us about a procurement commitment or an incentive commitment to horticulture uh, and veg growing that will make a difference, you know, starting now. I'm going to answer your first question first because it is really, really important. We have been in the common agricultural policy for 40 years. We have paid people just for owning land. They didn't have to grow a bean on it. They were just paid for owning land. That system is completely changing. This is transformational. It really is. So what people will now be paid for are producing as well as food, which is of course what we need farmers to do producing public goods those will be environmental they will be they will help towards the net zero target but they will also help us to produce food and target our money in a what way that we simply haven't we, been the, able the, to the, before it, it was michael gove a couple of years ago or longer who started talking about this new direction of public good and we still haven't really seen the flesh on the bones we, we have an agriculture bill that's much vaunted and is on its way. But what, I mean, can you... No, we passed the Agriculture Act at the end yeah. of last year. We then left the European Union transition period at the end of last year. We now have a seven period, seven year period to work with farmers and horticulturalists to get our new systems right. We have front loaded a lot of what we're doing in the teeth of quite a lot of opposition because we are so keen to get these goods out of the land that w that we want to see as government, our farmers and growers help us to. I, I'm going to allow this little spat I, one sorry, more just exchange. One more and <laughs> Precisely because I tried to argue amendments in the House of Lords about this. The elms at the moment do not reward any sort of food growing. That is the principle which, for instance, the National Trust supports that, which is saying you can get money for food. Therefore, we only pay money for intangibles like hedgerows and water quality. I understand that, but there were many other places within that bill where subsidies could have gone towards vegetable growing and they were not allowed and they were defeated, whichever ones went back into the Commons. So I still fail to see how what is coming ahead is actually going to change this equation that uh, healthy food costs a lot more than unhealthy food. I don't get well, it I, yet. I, I just want to move here because <laughs> a very... I'm an, an dying an, to come back. An, I'm sure you are, but another very, very big part of this equation is retail. And if, 
if our vegetable growers and horticulturalists feel unsupported by government, I think mm. it's also fair to say that they often feel a bit battered and bruised by the retailers who drive them extremely hard on price, who have for a long time systematically uh, pretty much forced them to waste huge amounts of vegetables with their ridiculous, uh, I was, I, I, I was going to start by saying r rigorous, and it quickly turned to ridiculous <laughs> because they are ridiculous, uh, cosmetic standards, which means that uh, many, many thousands of tonnes of slightly bendy carrots or, 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 or slightly uh, open cauliflowers or whatever it might be, uh, end up being trashed every year. And, uh, and, and the cost of that waste is borne usually by the farmer. Is that culture changing at Tesco? Is it changing in the retail section, Sarah? So from a Tesco perspective, it's absolutely changing. And if I take apples as a good example, as a, as a good British crop. Well, 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 you may take apples, but we are here to talk about veg, you know. Okay. And, and you know, in a way, fruit is quite often the easy yeah. sell. Uh, when you're talking about putting healthy food through to children, uh, children are quite happy on the whole to eat sweet apples and bananas and, and things like that. So I would really actually like you to give me a veg example rather than a fruit example. OK, I'll give you a potato one to start with, which okay, isn't quite there. Not <laughs> but, but I'll start well, there and then we can move, this will be, move this will forward. Be the people growing spuds for the crisps you sell? Or? So, um, the potatoes, customers do want certain kind of potatoes. So we do know that we will put our, our products into different specifications. So whether it's our entry tier, whether it's our mid tier, or whether it's our finest tier, but customers don't want massive potatoes. So the collaboration between two of our suppliers to ensure that actually a mashed potato site was put on the packing site meant that nothing was going to waste. But take carrots, for example. I, I was glad because I was going to say, let's get away from potatoes yep. because they're not going to solve the health crisis yep. by getting people to eat more potatoes. Carrots will make a but difference. But from a farming perspective, trying to ensure that we take the whole crop is, is the same whether it's a strawberry or whether it's okay. a potato or a carrot. So but Carrots so, and parsnips. I've visited farm, farms, farmers. I, I've seen literally seen farmers weep at the amount of carrots and parsnips they were being forced to throw away because of supermarket cosmetic standards. Are you, are, are your carrot suppliers throwing away fewer carrots than they were five years ago? Yes. How, how, can you, how can you be sure of that? What have you done to make that happen? So we have our food waste targets, as you're aware of. So we are halving the amount of food waste across the entire supply chain. We started with our own operation because it was something we could, we could deal with and first. You're, you're counting waste at the grower. Not, because you can do that yeah, relatively so, easily by changing the food you waste around the back of the supermarket, yep. but it's what you're causing to be wasted at the farm gate that is the significant problem. So we know all of our growers, wherever they are around the world, and it's important that we have a relationship with them. We have the same standard in the UK as we do kind of importing as well. And to take something like the carrots, we have a specification variation. So if they aren't something that we think customers would buy, we've got our perfectly imperfect range that we would still sell those products to customers and put them in a, in a different packaging so that we know that people will still buy them and actually they sell very well um, when they are sold at a discount. Um, so to ensure that we support farmers the whole way and actually have conversations with them and we have 10 sustainable farming groups where we actually work to really understand that and, and they're led by the farmers so that we can understand how we can improve the way we work with the farmers and um, whether it's further upstream whether it's further in advance so that we can make sure that we are supporting our farmers to ensure that we can take as much of the crop as, as is absolutely possible. Charlotte you're, you're also um, buying directly from farmers veg growers on a huge scale and uh, to supply an operation that, that runs on extremely tight margins. Have you, have you changed or are you changing the way you work with farmers to ultimately get more veg on your plates? Absolutely, just by tracking our food waste much more closely. So all our sites will now have food waste measurement and that sort of iterates back into the supply chain. So that, that gets better all the time. Obviously, we don't have the cosmetic issue and the, the training piece we talked about, you know, is very much about encouraging the use of a whole carrot. So we put peelings into kimchi so we don't waste anything. There's just a couple of other things I wanted to pick up, yes, which were please. really interesting earlier. So, so you talked about um, this perception that healthier was more expensive and I, and I guess retail is a very different model to ours but in our industry we're a low margin business uh, we can't 
um, sell our uh, services for more to our clients. So we are going to bring about our transformation to plant forward without being a higher cost. So that's very critical for our path. So I think it can be done in our industry um, and we will pioneer that. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was government procurement. So half of our business is government contracts, um, either directly or often it's through local authorities. And we would really welcome more regulation, more requirements. We're 80% already local seasonal British produce, but that is the way to drive change at scale. So, so, so I think that's really interesting. That I mean, I, I, I basically hear Charlotte saying to Victoria, government procurement, we deliver that, bring it on. Please give us the policies, give us the, the, the restrictions and the focus to make this happen. And really briefly, the most important thing Charlotte said um, to me was that local sustainable British doesn't have to be more expensive. So when we do our procurement review, which is taking place this summer, it is really important that that message is hammered home. Alan. Can I just say how important this is? How important it is to get this right? You know, we haven't got a lot of time. We've got a climate emergency. We have a health emergency. We need to increase the amount of fruit and vegetable that's available for consumption for everybody in this country. That will, so th that's for three reasons. Number one, it will improve the health of the nation. And the, this is the unhealthiest nation in Europe. Number two, it will it, it will reduce, because we import something like 60 to 70% of our fruit and vegetable into the UK, it will, it will reduce our environmental impacts in those other countries. We are having a devastating impact on other countries. Half of that imported fruit comes from climate vulnerable countries. So they are already at risk of significant environmental and climate change, and they won't be able to produce those. Their, the, our consumption of their fruit is having a negative impact, or fruit and vegetable having a negative impact on their environment. But but number three, the security of the food supply in the UK is dependent upon a UK poli food policy that puts front and centre the need for us to produce food here in the UK in an environmentally sustainable way. And we cannot continue this over-reliance on other countries for our food. We can grow it all here and we're just not doing it. And there's a real, why aren't we doing it? And, you know, if we're serious about the, the, the food security of this country, increasing the resilience of food supply in this country, it's got to be a primary uh, policy goal. Why aren't we doing it, Victoria? I think the goal is not to have 100% food grown here that we, that we eat. We like a bit of variety in our diets and that's not something I think we should apologise for. But I do think that Alan is right and we should be much, much more ambitious. And 16% of fruit grown here that we consume is way off where it should be. We have and what a was the figure you gave for veg? 53% altogether because for fruit there are, and veg. Because there are a few places better in the world for growing we, veg. We are idea well, so, you can see all around you, we are ideally placed. We have a perfect climate for horticulture in this country. It doesn't also take up absurd amounts of land space either. It's, it's a good intensive crop with good results. We have young farmers who are eager to get on board. I really think that government gets this at the moment. I am as passionate about this as any member of this panel and I really think we will see rapid change. Well, let, let's hope so. But there, there's one thing I really think we, we should focus on now for, as we come into maybe the, 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 the last section of this discussion. If we, if we do start delivering on all the, if government starts delivering and business starts delivering and food service um, really work together to make these things happen, um, there's still a danger that because of the really worrying food inequality that we have in this country, that even if we st start to see the dial changing at some levels, that the poorest uh, families and perhaps those who most need a boost in their diet and more vegetables to help them to be healthy could still get left behind. And Rosie, I know you feel incredibly strongly about this. What are policy-wise, how, how do we tackle the dietary uh, inequality issue? Well, with, with all the things that we're doing, plus, without a doubt, there has to be a level of making the fruit and vegetables uh, that people need to eat much cheaper, much more available. I mean, if you live in, I hate the expression food deserts, but they mm. do exist. And they're very complicated um, food and poverty. I mean, I was listening to a thing the other day where a bunch of kids were saying, well, actually we love the fast food restaurants because there's somewhere to go. Mm. The truth is that if you're 
in the lowest percentiles of income. You're also in the lowest percentiles of all sorts of other advantages. You may not have somewhere to cook. You certainly aren't going to be getting education at school. Your school meals may not be that great. Your parents are probably time poor and stressed. So we have to try to look at the package, which is why food equality and why food in itself is such a big thing. I think that um, when, when I helped run the London Food Board, we, we had a project called Capital Growth and we created two and a half thousand new community gardens in London. It's 200 acres of London that was Branfield site. We had an empowered local council that all the way down the line, if you empower localities and you empower things, I remember when we started, people said all these will end up in Kensington. Actually, the truth was as far from Kensington mm. as you could get it. Mm. In fact, they were in high rise estates people wanted to do it. And we have disenfranchised people from it. So a lot of effort, some money, and a big advertising campaign, and a big campaign around it could bring that back. But there is also going to have to be some effort from government's end. It is not all about education. And it drives me nuts when the industry says, oh, you just need to be told that it's good for you to eat vegetables. That doesn't work. We need proper advertising campaigns, proper access, proper procurement, and this is why this thing, food is a system. It's very difficult to pick off a single thing. You want to absolutely come at the whole thing all together, which hopefully, if a lot of the food strategy gets implemented, will do. There are many, many different levers that, that can be pulled, and I think um, uh, the government sometimes looked a bit picky, but if it's going to get anywhere near its target of for example, halving childhood obesity by 2030. It's kind of got to pull all the levers, hasn't it? I'm going to leave that sitting with you as a rhetorical question because I want, <laughs> I want, to, ask, I want to ask Alan. Um, at the beginning, um, we heard the statistic that to, in calorific terms, to get calories inside your family using vegetables is three times as, as expensive as it is using high sugar, uh, fat and starchy foods. Um, is, is, is that statistic likely, does it feel to you set in stone or are there levers that can be, called, uh, are there levers that can be pulled to alter that uh, so that we change the, 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 the sheer finances of healthy eating? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really important question. Remember, we don't just eat for calories. We don't just eat for dietary energy. So the, the joy of fruit and vegetables is that they come with all these other important things, the vitamins and the minerals that are part of a healthy diet and essentially also fibre, which is so critical for, and so lacking from the UK diet. The, the levers are around uh, finance, of course, the cost of food, but also the availability of food. But also, you know, those, these discussions we've been having about recognizing our role and our responsibility. And you can't tell me that somebody in a tower block doesn't care. Yeah. So it's not, they, they're not choosing this. They, they have a very constrained choice about what they're eating. And that's, that needs to be altered. That needs to be shifted so that people can make a choice that they really care about. And, and so that's, but it's also about shifting the dial, making it really normal to have a diet that is largely plant-based, making it really normal to eat vegetables and fruit as part of your uh, everyday meals. And, you know. and doesn't that mean with the youngest kids of all, kids who are literally going onto solid foods for the first time, they need to have vegetables in front yes. of them pretty much from the year dot. Uh, yes. How do we make that happen? Because that, that, that does seem to be in, in, in some places like a challenging thing to, to, to dream of or to deliver. Well, one thing would be very simple, which is that the government actually implemented their own guidelines in yeah. terms of, of many of the foods. And I'm not going to sit here naming all the companies, but they violate the laws and they market baby milk substitutes to uh, babies that are under six months. We have the lowest breastfeeding rate in the world, I think, at the moment. We've never had a proper breastfeeding campaign on behalf of the government. It's seen still with a bit of a snigger and an embarrassment. Um, children and mothers then become prey to this, these very intense advertising campaigns to say that it's best for your children to buy things like these pouches, which are, as I said, like boiled sweets to eat and also bad for their teeth. And are costing, if you, lived, if you had your child on three a day, it's about nine quid. 
it's it's sort of insane and yet they're sold as this is doing your best for your baby so there is a lot of very unpleasant things that i think the government could very quickly just say no victoria's got definitely got something to answer there but i'd like to, <laughs> i'd like to ask charlotte because you are obviously involved in delivering food to sometimes very small children uh, what what are you doing and what could you be doing more of perhaps to get young children more excited about vegetables that are going to sustain them and make them resilient for the rest of their lives? I mean, we're already trying to get them more excited. I, I, we would just like to see more kids enjoying school meals than do at the moment. Um, I mean, I, this isn't a compass example, it's a personal example, but my kids are at a state primary school where it's mandated vegetarian, mandated no pat lunch. So for six years, all the children have a vegetarian only lunch um and don't bring in anything from home and you know it well how about that it can I, be done we said we said you had a thing to answer and, and how about that for a national policy what about mandating that some meals are simply meat free in all schools where where, where the government can influence what, what children are going to eat. I genuinely think that these things are best decided at the local level. I don't want, as a farming minister, to sit in Whitehall making decisions on behalf of every school in the country. But that's not to say I don't think we shouldn't promote buying local, buying sustainable for schools and, and for companies such as, so as we're, we're, compass. We're, we're back in the, the mode of I, a, let's advise, let's not the, interfere, no, 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 let's no, not legislate. That's not at all. I think the new procurement review w will be quite groundbreaking. Can I just mention one other thing which Rosie touched on, which I think is really important, but we haven't really gone into, which is that, yes, food poverty is about poverty, frankly. Food is really relatively cheap in this country in terms of the spend. The problem with food poverty is is both about the cost of living, the cost of rent, for example, but also about time poverty. And one of the things that you said, Hugh, how do we encourage babies to eat a variety of foods? Well, we model good behaviour. That's how children learn at home. Yes, there are things that government can and will do in the public sector, but a lot of this has to happen in the kitchen. I, I'm, I'm with you on that, but how do we, I mean, we have to raise a generation now for whom that is second nature. And if we just leave the nation's kitchens to do it on their own, it's not going to happen because it isn't happening now. So we do need uh, young f families with young children, uh, with babies, to make better choices from the very beginning, uh, leading those children towards a sense that veg is normal. But how are you going to make that happen? Well, I, I think we've touched on so much in the course of this discussion. It's been great. We've, we've touched on regulation, which absolutely has a role. We've touched on public procurement. Again, very important. We've touched on education. Very important. We've touched on advertising and the role that the retail retailers have to play. Government has a role in encouraging all of this. You also said... Encouraging you, or legislating in some cases? Well, in and some we, cases, we, it's it, back it, to, it will It's require. back to pulling all the levers. Absolutely. We've, we've, most of, pretty much all the levers have had a bit of a, an outing a in this session. Well, they've, had, <laughs> they've had an outing in this session. Now, is government going to pull them all? Well, we're going to respond to the food strategy. One thing you said is that this is all very difficult. Yes, some of it is very difficult, but it's not too difficult and we have to do it. So I am sure that all of these levers, if you like, are going to be pulled to varying extents um, over the course of the next couple of years. And what is also important with my farming minister background is that we actually grow the stuff so that people can eat it. At the moment, we don't do that. Thank you very much. And reluctant as I am to let the government have the last word, it, it was starting to sound like commitments to pulling most, if not all, of the levers we've discussed today in forthcoming policy. So let's hope that that happens. Thank you very much uh, to my panel for keeping everyone else on the panel on their toes and for sharing their ideas on this incredibly important subject. It's not just about what we think. All those of you who are watching, we'd love to hear your comments. Uh, the Food Foundation is an incredibly open forum and, we, and if you think there's anything we've missed out today, please use the hashtag Veg Summit to tell us what you think we should all be doing to make sure that the UK eats much more veg. Thanks very much and thank you to the panel. Thank you.